Dear friends, I think most of you are fond of Edward. His driver and fireman, Charlie Sands and Sidney Hever, are fond of him too. They were very pleased when they knew I was giving Edward a book all to himself. Edward is old, and some of the other engines were rude about the clanking noise he made as he did his work. They aren't rude now. These stories tell you why. The Author The Railway Series Book 9 Edward the Blue Engine Story 1 Cows Edward the Blue Engine was getting old. His bearings were worn, and he clanked as he puffed along. He was taking 20 empty cattle trucks to a market town. The sun shone, the birds sang, and some cows grazed in the field by the line. Come on! Come on! Come on! puffed Edward. Oh! 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 Ha, 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 screamed the trucks. Edward puffed and clanked. The trucks rattled and screamed. The cows were not used to trains. The noise and smoke disturbed them. They twitched up their tails and ran. They galloped across the field, broke through the fence, and charged the train between the 13th and 14th trucks. The coupling broke, and the last seven trucks left the rails. They were not damaged and stayed upright. They ran for a short way along the sleepers before stopping. Edward felt a jerk, but didn't take much notice. He was used to trucks. Bother those trucks, he thought. Why can't they come quietly? He ran on to the next station before either he or his driver realized what had happened. When Gordon and Henry heard about the accident, they laughed and laughed. Fancy letting cows to break his train. They wouldn't dare do that to us. We'd show them, they boasted. Edward pretended not to mind, but Toby was cross. You couldn't help it, Edward, he said. They've never met cows. I have, and I know the trouble they are. Some days later, Gordon rushed through Edward's station. Boop, boop, he whistled. Mind the cows. Ah, ha, 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 he chortled, panting up the hill. Hurry, 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 puffed Gordon. Don't make such a fuss. Don't make such a fuss, grumbled his coaches. They rumbled over the viaduct and roared through the next station. A long stretch of line lay ahead. In the distance was a bridge. It had high terrapids each side. It seemed to Gordon that there was something on the bridge. His driver thought so too. Wow, Gordon, he said and shut off steam. Puh, said Gordon. It's only a cow. Joe! Joe! he hissed, moving slowly onto the bridge. But the cow wouldn't shoo. She had lost her calf and felt lonely. Moo, she said sadly, walking towards him. Gordon stopped. His driver, fireman, and some passengers tried to send her away, but she wouldn't go, so they gave it up. Presently, Henry arrived with a train from the other direction. What's this? He said grandly. A cow? I'll soon settle her. Be off! Be off! He hissed. But the cow turned and mooed at him. Henry backed away. I don't want to hurt her, he said. Drivers, firemen, and passengers again tried to move the cow, but failed. Henry's guard went back and put detonators on the line to protect his train. At the nearest station, he told them about the cow. That must be Bluebell, said a porter thoughtfully. Her calf is here ready to go to market. We'll take it along. So they unloaded the calf and took it to the bridge. Moo! Moo! wailed the calf. Moo! Moo! bellowed Bluebell. She nuzzled her calf happily and the porter led them away. The two trains started. Not a word. Keep it dark, whispered Gordon and Henry as they passed. But the story soon spread. Well, 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 chuckled Edward. 
two big engines afraid of one cow. Afraid? Rubbish, said Gordon huffily. We didn't want the poor thing to hurt herself by running against us. We stopped so as not to excite her. You see what I mean, my dear Edward. Yes, Gordon, said Edward gravely. Gordon felt somehow that Edward saw only too well. Story 2 Bertie's Chase We're late, fussed Edward. Peep, 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 where is Thomas? He doesn't usually make us wait. Oh dear, what can the matter be, sang the fireman. Johnny's so long at... Never you mind about Johnny, laughed the driver. Just you climb on the cab and look for Thomas. Can you see him? No, the guard looked at his watch. Ten minutes late, he said to the driver. We can't wait here all day. Look again, Sid, said the driver, just in case. The fireman got to his feet. Can you see him? No, he answered. There's Bertie Butts in a tearing hurry. No need to bother about him, though. Likely he was on a coach tour or something. He clambered down. Right away, Charlie, said the guard, and Edward puffed off. Toot! Toot! Stop! Stop! wailed Bertie, roaring into the yard. But it was no good. Edward's last coach had disappeared into the tunnel. Bother, said Bertie. Bother Thomas's fireman not coming to work today? Oh, why did I promise to help the passengers catch the train? That'll do, Bertie, said his driver. A promise is a promise, and we must keep it. I'll catch Edward or bust, said Bertie grimly as he raced along the road. Oh, my gears and axles, he groaned, toiling up the hill. I'll never be the same bus again. Toot, 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 toot! I see him! Hooray! Hooray! He cheered as he reached the top of the hill. He's reached the station, Bertie groaned the next minute. No, he stopped by a signal. Hooray! Hooray! And he tore down the hill, his brakes squealing at the corners. His passengers bounced like balls in a bucket. Well done, Bertie, they shouted. Go it, go it! Hens and dogs scattered in all directions as he raced through the village. Wait, wait! He tooted, skidding into the yard. He was just in time to see the signal drop, the guard wave his flag, and Edward puff out of the station. His passengers rushed to the platform, but it was no good, and they came bustling back. I'm sorry, said Bertie unhappily. Never mind, Bertie, they said. After him quickly. Third time lucky, you know. Do you think we'll catch him at the next station, driver? There's a good chance, he answered. Our roads keep close to the line, and we can climb hills better than Edward. He thought for a minute. I'll just make sure. He then spoke to the station master, while the passengers waited impatiently in the bus. This hill is too steep! This hill is too steep, grumbled the coaches as Edward snorted in front. They reached the top at last and ran smoothly into the station. Pip, peep, whistled Edward. Get in quickly, please. The porters and people hurried, and Edward impatiently waited to start. Peep, whistled the guard, and Edward's driver looked back. But the flag didn't wave. There was a distant, don't, don't. And the station master, running across, snatched the green flag out of the guard's hand. Then everything seemed to happen at once. Don't, don't, don't! Bellowed Bertie. His passengers poured onto the platform and scrambled into the train. The station master told the guard and driver what had happened, and Edward listened. I'm sorry about the chase, Bertie, he said. Ugh, my fault, panted Bertie. Late at junction. <laughs> You didn't know about Thomas's passengers. Pip, pip, goodbye, Bertie, we're off, whistled Edward. Three cheers for Bertie, called the passengers. They cheered and waved until they were out of sight. Save 
from scrap. There is a scrap yard near Edward Station. It is full of rusty old cars and machinery. They are bought there to be broken up. The pieces are loaded into trucks and Edward pulls them to the steelworks where they are melted down and used again. One day, Edward saw a traction engine in the yard. Hello, he said. You're not broken and rusty. What are you doing here? I'm Trevor, said the traction engine sadly. They're going to break me down next week. What a shame, said Edward. My driver says I only need some paint, brasso and oil to be as good as new. Trevor went on sadly. But it's no good. My master doesn't want me. I guess it's because I'm old fashioned. Edward snorted indignantly. People say I'm old fashioned, but I don't care. The fat controller says I'm a useful engine. My driver says I'm useful too replied Trevor. I sometimes feel ill, but I don't give up like these tractors. I struggle on and finish the job. I've never broken down in my life, he ended proudly. What work did you do? asked Edward kindly. My master would send us from farm to farm. We fresh up the corn, hauled logs, sawed timber, and did lots of other work. We made friends at all the farms and saw them every year. The children loved to see us come. They followed us in crowds and watched us all day long. My driver would sometimes give them rides. Trevor shut his eyes, remembering. I like children, he said simply. Oh yes, I like children. Broken up, what a shame! Broken up, what a shame! clanked Edward as he went back to work. I must help Trevor, I must! He thought of the people he knew, who liked engines. Edward had lots of friends, but strangely none of them had room for a traction engine at home. It's a shame! It's a shame! he hissed as he brought his coaches to the station. Then... Beep! Beep! he whistled. Why didn't I think of him before? Waiting there on the platform was the very person. Morning, Charlie. Morning, Sid. Hello, Edward. You look upset. What's the matter, Charlie? He asked the driver. There's a traction engine in the scrapyard, Vicar. He'll be broken up next week, and it's a shame. Jem Cole says he never drove a better engine. Do save him, sir. You've got room, sir. Yes, Edward. I've got room, laughed the Vicar. But I don't need a traction engine. He'll saw wood and give children rides. Do buy him, sir, please. We'll see, said the Vicar, and climbed into the train. Jem Cole came on Saturday afternoon. The Reverend's coming to see you, Trevor. Maybe he'll buy you. Do you think he will? Asked Trevor, hopefully. He will, and I've lit your fire and cleaned you up, said Jem. When the vicar and his two boys arrived in the evening, Trevor was blowing off steam. He hadn't felt so happy for months. Watch this, Reverence, said Jem, and Trevor chuffled happily about the yard. Oh, Daddy, do buy him, pleaded the boys, jumping up and down in their excitement. Now I'll try, and the vicar climbed up beside Jem. Show your paces, Trevor, he said, and drove him about the yard. Then he went to the office and came out smiling. I got him cheap, Jem, cheap. You hear that, Trevor, cried Jem. The Reverend saved you, and you'll live at the vicarage now. Peep, peep whistled Trevor happily. Will you drive him home for me, Jem, and take these scallywags with you? They won't want to come in the car when there's a traction engine to ride on. Trevor's home in the vicarage orchard is close to the railway, and he sees Edward every day. His paint is spotless, and his brush shines like gold. He saws firewood in winter, and Jem sometimes borrows him when a tractor fails. Trevor likes doing his old jobs, but his happiest day is the church fate. Then, with a long wooden seat bolted to his bunker, he chuffers round the orchard, giving rides to children. Long afterwards, you will see him shut his eyes, remembering. I like children, he whispers happily. Story 4. 
old iron. One day, James had to wait at Edward's station till Edward and his train came in. This made him cross. Late again! He shouted. Edward only laughed, and James fumed away. Edward is impossible! He grumbled to the others. He clanks about like a lot of old iron, and he is so slow he makes us wait. Thomas and Percy were indignant. Old iron! They snorted. Slow? Why, Edward could beat you in a race any day. Really? said James huffily. I shall like to see him do it. One day, James's driver did not feel well when he came to work. I'll manage, he said, but when they reached the top of Gordon's Hill, he could hardly stand. The fireman drove the train to the next station. He spoke to the signalman, put the trucks in the siding, and uncoupled James, ready for shunting. Then, he helped the driver over to the station and asked them to look after him and find a relief. Suddenly, the signalman shouted and the fireman turned round and saw James puffing away. He ran hard, but he couldn't catch James and soon came back to the signal box. The signalman was busy. All traffic halted, he announced at last. Up and down main lines are clear for 30 miles and the inspector's coming. The fireman mopped his face. What happened? he asked. Two boys were on the footplate. They tumbled off when James started. I shouted at them, and they ran like rabbits. Just let me catch him, said the fireman grimly. I'll teach them to meddle with my engine. Both men jumped as the telephone rang. Uh, uh, yes, answered the signalman. He's here. Right, I'll tell him. The inspector's coming at once in Edward. He wants a shunter's pole and a coil of wire rope. What for? wondered the fireman. Search me, but you better get them quickly. The fireman was ready and waiting when Edward arrived. The inspector saw the pole and rope. Good man, he said. Jump in. We'll catch him, we'll catch him, puffed Edward, crossing to the up line in pursuit. James was laughing as he left the yard. What a lark, what a lark, he chuckled to himself. Presently, he missed his driver's hand on the regulator, and then... He realized there was no one in his cab. What should I do? He wailed. I can't stop. Help! Help! We're coming. We're coming. Edward was panting up behind with every ounce of steam he had. With a great effort, he caught up and crept alongside, slowly gaining till his smoke box was level with James's buffer beam. Steady, Edward. The inspector stood on Edward's front holding a noose of rope in the crook of the shunter's pole. He was trying to slip it over James's buffer. The engine swayed and lurched. He tried again and again. More than once he nearly fell, but just saved himself. At last! Got him! he shouted. He pulled the noose tight and came back to the cab safely, gently braking so as not to snap the rope. Edward's driver checked the engine's speed, and James's fireman scrambled across and took control. The engines puffed back side by side. So the old iron caught you after all, chuckled Edward. I'm sorry, whispered James. Thank you for saving me. That's all right. You were splendid, Edward. The fat controller was waiting and thanking the men warmly. A fine piece of work, he said. James, you can rest. And then take your train. I am proud of you, Edward. You shall go to the works and have your worn parts mended. Oh, thank you, sir, said Edward happily. It'll be lovely not to clank. The two naughty boys were soon caught by the police, and their fathers walloped them soundly. They were also forbidden to watch trains till they could be trusted. James's driver soon got well in hospital and is now back at work. James missed him very much. But he missed Edward more, and you'll be glad to know that when Edward came home the other day, James and all the other engines gave him a tremendous welcome. The fat controller thinks he'll be deaf for weeks.